and now oxygen carrying capacity oxygen is carried by hemoglobin which is present in the rbc so now you want to know what is the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin what is the normal hemoglobin value 12 to 15 gram percentage so in that 1 gram percentage of hemoglobin it carries 1.34 ml of oxygen okay if for example you consider 15 gram percentage is the value of hemoglobin then you will get nearly 20.1 ml that is the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin the person with hemoglobin having 15 gram percentage so this is oxygen carrying capacity okay clear and now we are going to see the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve and this hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve this is a sigmoid curve and this curve is going to tell you the oxygen saturation level so the x axis is mentioning the partial pressure of oxygen and y axis it is mentioning the hemoglobin saturation level the complete partial pressure of oxygen is 100 when the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 what is the saturation level of hemoglobin <clears throat> what is the saturation level of hemoglobin when the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 the saturation is also 100 and up to the level of 90 percentage of saturation you will get 90 percentage of saturation when there is nearly 60 partial pressure of oxygen. So up to this the curve is very steep. After that, once when it crosses 60 percent, 60 partial pressure of oxygen, the curve is becoming flat. At almost 90 of the partial pressure of oxygen, you are retaining the 100 percentage saturation and from 90 to 100 it is maintaining the stable 100 percent saturation level okay here why this concept has been coming over here is because at the level of 100 partial pressure you are getting 100 percentage saturation of hemoglobin with the oxygen at the level of 90 partial pressure also you are getting 100 percent saturation with the hemoglobin and the 90% saturation is obtained when you are almost at the level of 50 of partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, clear. In Beyond that level, if it becomes less than 50, there is a very steep decrease in the percentage saturation of the hemoglobin. So up to 50% you are getting... 90 percentage uh, up to 50 partial pressure you are getting 90 percentage of oxygen saturation so when there is a decrease of atmospheric oxygen from 100 to 50 you are able to do the respiratory process without any hindrance because there is only 10 percentage of partial pressure difference okay that is the reason in high altitudes even though if the partial pressure of oxygen is low in high altitudes, if it is not less than 50, the person was able to have normal breathing. But in case of partial pressure decreases more than 50, partial pressure, the person will have difficulty in breathing. So that is the basis why the person was able to survive normally in high altitudes if the atmospheric oxygen is to the level of at least 50 mmhg the person will obtain nearly 
ninety of the partial oxygen saturation. Okay, and now based on the concept of Bohr's effect, the oxygen transport is going to take place. What is this Bohr's effect is telling is the representation what we have seen over here. The partial pressure difference between the alveoli and the venous blood. And then from the arterial blood to the level of cells, the same difference you will have. The partial pressure difference between the alveoli and the venous blood and between the cells to the arterial blood vessels makes the oxygen to be delivered. So in case of Bohr's effect, what it is explaining here over here is oxygen transport. Oxygen always combines with the hemoglobin. And this is what is the scenario in the pulmonary circulation after the alveoli given the oxygen. Now this is going to the level of the cells. In the cells, after the metabolic end product, it will have enormous amount of carbon dioxide. So, the hemoglobin bringing oxygenated blood to the level of the cells. And here, because of excessive carbon dioxide accumulation, what happens? The bond between hemoglobin and the oxygen is released. Why? There is more carbon dioxide at the level of tissues. When compared to the oxygen, this high concentration of carbon dioxide at the level of tissues breaks the affinity between the hemoglobin and the oxygen. So now the hemoglobin is free. That hemoglobin go into the cell and that carbon dioxide go and bind with the hemoglobin and that is going back into the alveoli for the exchange process. So this process of exchange of oxygen and the carbon dioxide based upon the concentration gradient between oxygen and carbon dioxide that is called as Bohr's effect. Okay. In the level of alveoli, here the alveolar oxygen is more and the carbon dioxide here it is less when compared to the oxygen. Okay, both hemoglobin binds with the oxygen as well as with the carbon dioxide. Both are friends to the hemoglobin. Oxygen and hemoglobin directly they are enemies. But oxygen and carbon dioxide in either side they are friends to the hemoglobin. But based upon the concentration, if oxygen is higher concentration, the carbon dioxide gets detached from the hemoglobin. If carbon dioxide is in higher concentration, oxygen gets detached. When there is a carbon dioxide, oxygen is higher concentration. In which location? At the level of lungs. And carbon dioxide will be high at the level of the cells. So this differentiation makes the hemoglobin to attach with the oxygen, detach with the carbon dioxide and the exchange is taking place. Okay. So that is called as Bohr's effect. And in case of fetal circulation, the hemoglobin is having alpha 2 and gamma 2 subunit in its structure. This gamma 2 subunit is having more affinity with the oxygen. Even though the partial pressure of oxygen is less, even though the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is more, it will never detach from the hemoglobin because fetus requires more oxygen for its transfer. That is due to the alpha 2, gamma 2 subunit of the hemoglobin. And based upon the association and dissociation of hemoglobin with the oxygen, the hemoglobin dissociation curve shift to the right side and the left side. When the oxygen gets detached from the hemoglobin, when there is increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, when you will get carbon dioxide in the cells after the metabolic process, now the cell has done its metabolic process. 
so the temperature is high because it has done the metabolic process and that has given increase of carbon dioxide the increase of carbon dioxide it decreases the ph because the h plus is present and due to the glycosylation process there is increase of 2 comma 3 by this phosphoglycerate in the metabolic end product so all these factors will cause shift of hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve to the right side it indicates dissociation of oxygen from the hemoglobin this will take place at the level of cells when the curve is shifted to the right side it indicates the oxygen is dissociated from the hemoglobin on the other case when there is decrease in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide when there is decrease in the temperature when there is decrease in the 2 comma 3 bisphosphoglycerate especially in fetal hemoglobin and with the increase of ph the curve is shifted to the left side this will take place at the level of lungs it indicates association of oxygen with the hemoglobin okay clear yeah, so these are the factors which makes the curve to shift to the right and to the left side and we have a small case over here a 38 years old woman moves with her family from chennai to himalaya so what kind of shift will occur in its hemoglobin dissociation curve first what kind of defect the, the what kind of symptom this person will encounter from Chennai sea level moving to the high altitudes, there is decrease of oxygen in the atmosphere. Encounter hypoxia. The cells are in more and more demand for oxygen. So what happens? The hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve releases more and more of oxygen and shift of curve to the right side. Okay, so that is the question over here. What kind of shift the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve is encountering in this case? And moving on to the carbon dioxide transport. Carbon dioxide transport where you will encounter first the carbon dioxide from the cells enters into the blood. In the cells, the carbon dioxide concentration is high. And the RBC which is bringing the hemoglobin, the RBC will contain hemoglobin plus oxygen. So over here the RBC will have hemoglobin combined with the oxygen. When compared to the concentration of oxygen which has joined with the hemoglobin, the carbon dioxide concentration is high at the level of the cells. So this makes the bond to break between oxygen and the carbon dioxide and hemoglobin becomes free, releases the oxygen into the cells and the carbon dioxide is entering into the blood vessels. Okay, so now this carbon dioxide brought up by the venous blood and that is giving it to the level of the alveoli. So now this blood will come to the level of the alveoli. So carbon dioxide plus hemoglobin again the same mechanism. In the alveoli oxygen is higher level. So it breaks the bond between hemoglobin and the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide goes into the alveoli and it is exchanged with the oxygen and this mechanism is called as Haldane's effect. Bohr effect is dealing with the oxygen transport. Haldane effect is dealing with the carbon dioxide transport. In case of oxygen transport it is Bohr effect. In case of carbon dioxide transport it is Haldane's effect. And this 
oxygen transport it is just combining with the hemoglobin and it is called as oxyhemoglobin and it is doing the transferring process but in case of carbon dioxide which has joined with the hemoglobin at the level of the tissues it will not remain as a carbon dioxide itself in the meantime till it reaches the level of alveolus it will undergo the chemical reactional change as bicarbonates so this is process see this is the cell which is having the carbon dioxide and now this cell has entered into the rbc the carbon dioxide inside the rbc joined with the water in the presence of enzyme carbonic anhydrase it will form carbonic acid okay this carbonic acid further splits into bicarbonates this is bicarbonates and h plus molecule okay so this will happen in a continuous way during the carbon dioxide transport mechanism and the bicarbonate will be excess inside the rbc and that is a negative ion and this will move into the plasma until this rbc reaches the level of the alveoli okay if a negative molecule is moving out of the cell in order to maintain the equilibrium the chloride molecule is entering into the cell and this h plus which has formed over here from the splitting of carbonic acid that is combining with the hemoglobin and this bicarbonate going out to the plasma which is maintained the electric uh, electrolyte equilibrium is maintained by the chloride molecule and you call this mechanism as chloride shift mechanism which is also called as hamburger's reaction okay so after this rbc reach the level of alveoli everything is a reversible reaction so the chloride shift the chloride molecule will go out bicarbonate enters and hemoglobin splits h plus this h plus will come and join with the bicarbonates forms carbonic acid again it splits into water and carbon dioxide and at the level of alveoli the carbon dioxide is expired okay so this indicates also there is increase of h plus during carbon dioxide excess if there is increase of h plus during carbon dioxide excess this is going to be one of the signaling molecule for the neural regulation of respiration we will see it now okay haldane effect everything we have seen and now coming to the ventilation perfusion ratio okay i will talk about that later